Let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody, coast to coast, This Week in America. Almost to Heaven from Gene Nielsen is written to thank the community, church, hospital, and Gene's family for all that was accomplished while working together with Gene's emergency care one important morning. These values brought Jean back into realizing the importance of why she is here on earth. The book is an account of Jean's near-death experience with God. Jean died on August 26, 2013, was given another chance of life on August 28, 2013, because of the expertise of two doctors. Almost to Heaven is a testament to the power of prayer and faith. As she shares a very personal and life-changing spiritual experience, with down-to-earth honesty and vulnerability. Jean has a Bachelor of Science degree in elementary education with additional license in pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, and early childhood special education areas. Jean Nielsen, author of The Powerful and Moving Almost to Heaven, is our guest on This Week in America. Jean, welcome to the program. It's great to have you with us. Well, thank you, Rick, and thank you for having me. What a remarkable story. And I started by mentioning it, this book is sort of a thank you as well for the community. And that community was so important in, in what you went through. And you being here today, that town is, is New Ulm, Minnesota. Give us a little background on that town and why it's so important to you. Your, your hometown, you're very proud of it and should be. Yeah, it's a very unique community in the sense that when it uh, was settled, it's very generational. Germans settled it. It um, has become family-oriented from grandparents all the way down to great-grandkids. People know who each other are in the community. When new people come, they're very welcomed. You know, it yes. just is a they watch out for each other. They know who each other are, the school systems. We have four K-12 through systems, including a homeschool association, and they are very strong, which is remarkable because the community size is only a little over 13,000 itself, and we also have uh, the Martin Luther College here. So it's just a community that does take care of each other, and we just really appreciate being able to live here. Well, as people read the book, Almost to Heaven, they're going to, uh, to really fall in love with the community and the spirit of the community and the, everybody coming together. You mentioned sort of a family approach, and that's what comes across in the book, Almost to Heaven. Let's go back and talk about that night of August 26, 2013, when I said you, you died on that day. What happened that day? Well, it was back in the time that everything was just skyrocketing in prices. Um, Obamacare had kind of started to take off, as well as when the gas prices were up to about four bucks a gallon. Oh, I don't yes. know if you remember that. Remember it well, <laughs> yes. Still, yeah. still paying well, off my oil bu gas bills yeah. from that time. That was expensive, yes, I remember it well. It was. And my husband and I work in the human uh, services field. And at the time, um, we were with a, just a very local company. And the state and federal government were not putting any money into group home services or nursing home services or anything of the like. And they had bypassed us for about eight years in a row. So the staff was really starting to struggle financially, but we enjoyed the field and we wanted to stay with the field. And so the only thing my husband and I could do at the time was we had cut everywhere that we could cut. We don't have credit card debt or car payments or anything like that. So we wound up, I just thought I needed another job. So Another co-worker at the group home I was working at said that she had started working at this particular assisted living facility, and she enjoyed it. And she said, Jean, I think you would really enjoy it, too. We have one shift every two weeks. Why don't you apply and see what you think? And I walked into the facility, and it was very nice. I just thoroughly felt comfortable working there 
and working with the staff that I interviewed with. So I was offered the position and then went through the training. And that night I was my very first night off training. I was alone. It was the 10 to 6 shift. I had done all the major jobs that I was supposed to do. So I was pulling out the cart to do the cleaning in the front foyer area. And all of a sudden I did just start having some shortness of breath and sweating and Being as I was 52, I didn't think too much of it because I was dealing with old female issues anyway, and I was just going to wait it out, and I tried, and about 10 minutes later, it wasn't stopping or even ceasing, and I called the lead care provider who, gratefully, I had known for 13 years while working at the, uh, the group home facility that I work at, and I thought, Anybody else would think I was a nut calling in on the first shift off training and I'm sick. That doesn't happen too often. And they have had people walk out on day one. (laughs) And anyway, gratefully, I knew who this gal was and I told her what was going on. And she said, well, I'll be in a little bit. Just let me get my stuff gathered up and I, I will come as soon as I can. Just Try to stay by the door. You have the phone. Don't worry. So I just sat there and sat there, and about 10 minutes went by, and suddenly, you know, the gal wasn't coming, and I thought, I better call her back. And she said, I did. And she said, I'm on my way. I'm probably about a half an hour away. And I thought, a half an hour? I Uh, thought it was going to be a 10-minute drive. Yeah. (laughs) And she said, oh, no, I'm about 45 minutes out of town. I thought, oh, you didn't tell me that. So then she said, well, call the hospital. Maybe they can give you some ideas. And I called the hospital, and uh, the gal did say, you know, we can't do that anymore. We used to be able to, (laughs) but we just can't. And uh, I said, okay, well, so then I hung up. And then around 1 o'clock in the morning, my heart started racing. And this was very different. It's like this just is not a normal feeling. And so I called the dispatcher back and I said, you know, I need an ambulance. I finally got through the process of thinking about it. And it's like, well, I guess the only way I could get home was basically by an ambulance because it was a Sunday morning. And my husband was sleeping, so I couldn't get a hold of him. I couldn't get it. There was no taxi. Or there was just no other option to call but 911. And so I finally decided, well, I guess they want to send people home anyway. So I justified my call to 911, and I told the dispatcher what was going on. And she said, oh, yeah, we well, we know where it is. And, and who is this for? What are the residents? And I said, well, no, it's for me. I'm yes. the staff. And she was, Ah, really kind of panicked, just like, oh, my goodness, I'll send one out right away. And where are you? And I told her I was at the door. And um, I remember five minutes later, literally, they were at the door with the police behind them. And this is very typical in New Orleans, Minnesota, that the police always follow an ambulance call because then they have more help if needed. So once they got there, they were I was able to help myself. On, onto the gurney and could see the well I couldn't really see the EMTs but I could see them bringing in like the blood pressure cups and stuff like that and I could hear voices that I could answer the questions and I just ended up um, being loaded up on the gurney they rolled me out they had given me three baby aspirins to that were dissolvable. They asked me if I was out in the heat that day because it was a 95 degree day. Oh, yes. One of those real, uh, probably similar to what you have in Florida. Yes. But uh, <laughs> very hot, excruciatingly hot days, even in the shade. And I said, no, I was at the group home before this shift and I was in air condition all day. They asked me if I smoked, and I said, no, that I'm not overweight. 
I don't have high cholesterol issues or anything like that. And they just put me in the ambulance. And I remember turning around in the parking lot. And basically, I was out until I got in wake until I woke up in the emergency room at the New Orleans Medical Center. So, um, <clears throat> and, and then at that point, I don't know what time it was in the morning, of course, or anything, but I could hear some nurses and doctors, and they finally got a hold of our oldest daughter, who lived in town, Lori, and she um, was telling me that I could not go home with this condition, so I must have been in and out of it, a little delirious. I wasn't sure oh, yeah. what I was even telling. Yeah, so it it um, that after she had mentioned that, I uh, heard the the pilots from the uh, helicopter crew came in and they said, "Gene John's been doing this for twenty years, so you're in good hands." And I thought. Well, I already know I'm in good hands. I'm in New Orleans. They have yes. taken care of us very. <laughs> <laughs> they do with a nice many job. Issues be- yeah, with many issues before. And I thought it was an odd question that he would even. So I don't even know what I was saying. You know, I have no idea. <laughs> and then uh, they they rolled me out to the helicopter and started loading me up, and that's where my husband kept telling me that I was going to the best heart hospital in the world and I thought well why am I going there I just wanted to go home I only called 911 yes, to go home yes. we only live a couple blocks away you know I don't need all this and it, it was just crazy things going through my head and but they loaded me up anyway and they strapped me in there and boy I tell you Rick there's just not very much room in those things you cannot move and then my heart must have started racing as we lifted because the EMT, well, or I guess helicopter nurse, I don't know what they call, um, you know. The, oh, yes, yeah. The, Not sure of the term it, either. Yeah, crew, the crew in the helicopter. But anyway, he said, Gene, I'm going to shock you now. And I said, well, no, I, you know, I, I Finally, could speak a little bit. I said, "No, I'm scared. You know, I don't want to be shocked." And he, but he didn't listen to me, and he just shocked me anyway. And I was out. And then I was out until I could feel the helicopter descending into Minneapolis, and I could feel it very specifically descend. It was three times, and the the nurse had told me that he was going to take out my hearing aids at one point, and then he was going to take out my jewelry at one point. And then after that third drop, that I didn't hear anything more. And I thought to myself, whatever's going to happen is going to happen now, and I hope I did some good. That's just and such that a, was my, yep, yeah, such that an was my last story. thought. Yeah, well, until you got to that point, and what was... You know, going through your mind, it's interesting. You just wanted to go home at that point and had no idea what uh, what was ahead. The book we're talking about is Almost to Heaven by Jean Nielsen. That's N-I-E-L-S-E-N. You'll find the book available at stratton-press.com, the usual places there as well, information on our website. Time is going by so quickly. Let's talk about the near-death experience you had with God, because this is something that's uh, uh, so powerful in in hearing you talk about that. Give us a little background on that. What happened? Uh, well, once I went out, um, my next memory was coming out of a uh, square for lack of a better word, I guess. And it I was getting myself up over the square and I ended up into this room. I do not remember going through a tunnel or anything like that, but I remember lifting myself out of a square. And the room was very grayish, dark gray, um, Kind of like a snowy TV. I think I described it a little bit, oh, but yes. darker. Yes. And I could not 
picture anything. There was no ladders. There was, I couldn't see my, like a house. There were no calendars, no dates, nothing like that. It was just dark. dark. And um, I just kind of sat there for a while trying to figure out where I was. And then as I was kind of sitting there, I had tried um, calling for people who I knew that had died, some of my family, and they weren't coming. And then, you know, I had already tried calling, like, my husband down here on Earth, and and I knew that was ridiculous because he was in New Alm, you know, and I was at Abbott. And I thought, well, I, and then so for some bizarre reason, I also tried calling for our parish priest. And when I explained this to him after I came back and was well, he couldn't even believe it. He said, you mean you called me, you tried calling me on the phone? And I said, no, <laughs> I yelled for you. Yes. And he said, oh, okay. And I said, you didn't come. And then after I tried all those avenues, I sat for a while, and then it dawned on me. It was kind of like, oh, my gosh, I had a heart attack. I wonder if this is my time to die. And I slowly turned around and started to look up at the heavens to where I knew or was always taught God lived. And I looked up, and I could see these clouds coming. And they were coming slowly. They were moving very slowly. They were very white clouds. And then they kind of stopped overhead. Over, So I knew they were meant for me because there was nobody else around me anyway. And I thought, well, I have to say something and do something. But I didn't want to because I really didn't want to die. <laughs> I had yes, two exactly. grandkids at the yes. time. <laughs> And then uh, finally, God spoke, and he said, Jean, are you coming? And I, looked, I was still looking up, and, and um, it, it, I, I could hardly know, I hardly knew what to say, you know. And I thought, you know, I, when I was having this conversation with him, um, it was, you know, I, I didn't really know what to do. Exactly. So I Fully understandable, after. yes. And then um, I finally asked him if I could have a little bit more time because I thought my grandchildren still needed me. And then he said, well, how much time do you want? And so I started trying to figure that out because I had two little grandkids and the youngest or the oldest one was in kindergarten at the time. And, you know, they usually have those kindergarten graduations and things like that. Yes. And I, I thought, well, maybe I could, if I could just have a, see her graduate from kindergarten. And then I thought of our second granddaughter who was just born. She was only two months old. And I, then I, so I was, kind of started to negotiate a little bit. And I wanted <laughs> to be there for a all the grandchildren that we were going to have because so, I wanted to be fair to all of them. Well, exactly. <laughs> well, yes. Yes. <laughs> so after I said, well, can I have enough time to be with all our grandchildren for all their life events? And God said, that much time? Well, what are you going to do for me? So, I tried to list all the things that I was doing for God at the time, which I thought was a strange question because God already knows what I'm doing. Yes. But as I look back at it, I know he was holding me accountable for my actions. And I was going to church and saying the rosary and doing different things and prayers. I'm Catholic oriented, uh, going to mass weekly, you know, I was a Eucharistic minister and sacristan, and I was, so I was listing all these things and all the volunteer activities that I, I had done and was doing. And finally, after after I got done, he, I could only come up with about four things. And it's like, that's all I could come up with in 52 years of life was four things that I could think of that I was doing for God. 
that's just not a very big list. And I kind of got a little disgusted with myself. I thought I should have been doing more. And so I finally looked back up and I said, well, I could still be a better person. And then at that point, he was deciding what to do. I heard, I started hearing uh, voices coming through at that point. And it was some singing from above. And then I could also hear voices from below, like in the same spot where I called for our parish priest. And as I turned around, I could kind of see little silhouettes coming up, but I couldn't see who these people were. But I, it was sort of like when you're in kindergarten and you drew your, the back of your head kind of. And oh, yes, yes. It, yeah, they were kind of coming up like that. And so I was just watching all these people, but I kind of thought maybe they're praying for me. I don't understand because I couldn't see. I couldn't physically see them. I just saw the outline, so to speak. But I could tell God was listening to the prayers too because whenever a new silhouette came up, the clouds would move in that same direction. So I knew God was listening to those prayers too. And then finally after a while, I looked back up again. I said, look, I think they're praying for me. And then after that point, a few more silhouettes came up, and he did say, well, then I will give you another chance. And then the prayers were stopped, and I kind of looked back down, and I had started quickly going back down into the same I think they call it a portal, is what they... Oh, okay, yes, yes. Yeah, um, I don't know, charismatic realm calls it, they call it a a portal. And then I thought I'd better ask one more question, and I am a big Green Bay Bay Packer fan. (laughs) I love this. (laughs) Yeah, and uh, I thought... I, I better ask God about the Packers because I live in Minnesota and maybe I screw it up because I'm a Packer fan instead of a Minnesota Viking fan. <laughs> so that's what was going on to my head. So I had a conversation with God about the Green Bay Packers because I wanted to be sure that it was okay to still be a Green Bay Packer fan. And, and, <laughs> and Obviously it is. You're, God, still a, you're still a Packer fan, right? Yeah, that's I mean, once you're a Packer fan, you're always, always a Packer fan. A Packer fan. No matter how many it. yeah, no matter how many lives you have, you're always going to be a uh, a Packer fan. This is such a remarkable, a powerful and, and moving story. Almost to Heaven from Gene Nielsen. That's N I E L S E N. The book available, Stratton Press dot com, all of the usual places. The full story is there. We've got a couple of minutes left in the program. What impact, briefly, the near-death experience, how did that change your life and your relationship with God? Because you were sort of reevaluating what you did for God before you had the opportunity to to, to come back, to, to live again. How did this change your relationship? Yeah, you know, I have, um, when you are a Catholic, you are trained into several different sacraments. And one of them is the sacrament of reconciliation, where you can go in and tell your priest of sins and then be absolved of your sins. And by doing so, uh, then you're back into full communion with the church and can be receiving the communion at the Mass. And that's how my relationship changed with God, because years back, they had changed some of the format, and I thought, oh, I am not going to learn anything else new again in my whole life. I'm done. So so I skipped going to confession. So what happened with my relationship with God was the fact that I returned to going to confession and receiving all of the sacraments as we were trained by the church to do. And then you are spiritually more included into being a full member of the church. Um, That was my biggest change. So it did have an an impact on your life. It did make a 
a positive change in your life. I've got about a minute left here. How is your health today? You had a remarkably quick recovery. How are you doing today? I did. I, I'm blessed. I am on the same meds that they started with after the heart attack. I've not had to increase my meds. Fantastic. I had, um, I keep up with cardiology appointments. It's gone from three times a year to one time a year. And then I've, my physician is also part of that picture is with a physical once a year. It's very basic health needs. I continue to have low cholesterol. I'm not overweight. I go to the gym yet three times a week. And I keep up with the speed that I'm should be at i've kind of surpassed that a little bit sounds like it, um, yes so you're doing quite yeah. well that's a re- remarkable story i'm going to uh, take another 30 seconds or so here what do you hope people take away i mean it's a remarkable story but there are a lot of lessons in there for all of us as we read almost to heaven what do you hope the takeaway it, is for the readers there are lots of lessons. The readers, I want them to know that their prayers work and they are appreciated. And even if you believe that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing spiritually, you can do more to be sure that you are in the right relationship with God and I just want people to keep praying because somebody will have an impact from that. My sister just had a same remarkable story with a friend of hers husband who had COVID and suffering. And he was not a believer in God until he came back and he now knows that he had another near death experience and is so grateful for the prayers, and he has changed. So you just have to keep believing that there is goodness out in the world. People do do the right thing. We get overshadowed by all the negativity that all the goodness gets shoved under the rug, and I just think people need to hear more inspiration. They need to hear more positive things that are going out there, I kind of wish the word no was never invented. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it's sort of, Kids. as you, as you're telling your story, just remember, you know, God's words to Jean. So what have you done for me? And I think that sort of uh, puts things in perspective. It did for you. It gave you a whole different evaluation of your life. It's uh, it's such a remarkable book, Gene's story. It's serious. It's lighthearted. She talks to God about the Green Bay Packers. You'll find all of that. And in Gene's book, Almost to Heaven, Gene Nielsen, N-I-E-L-S-E-N, Book available at stratton-press.com, uh, Amazon, the usual places. Link onto our website and get all of the information. Gene, thank you for taking the time to, to tell your story. Thank you for sharing uh, the book that's helping so many people. And uh, uh, continued good health. And thank you for being with us on the program. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate your time and expertise as well. It's been a pleasure. The book is Almost to Heaven. Gene Nielsen is the author, N-I-E-L-S-E-N. Find it available at stratton-press.com. We're back on today's program after these messages. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bechet, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again at thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.